This is Larry Jordan. One of the questions that I get asked the most is which high definition video format is the best for my project? <laughs> That's just not answerable. There's too many video formats. There's over 12 different high definition families and depending upon how you count there's over 400 different high definition video formats that you could use. How do you pick the right one? And the answer is, the only way that you can pick the right one is to understand some of the technology behind each of these different formats that we work with, whether it's HDV or XDCAM HD or HDCAM. And that's what this tutorial is about. I want to spend some time explaining some of the technology behind these formats so you can make a more informed decision. But before we start to take a look at high def video formats, we need to back up one step and take a look at hard disks first. Our ability to edit video is dependent upon the performance of your entire computer system. And part of that computer system is your hard disk. And in fact, the way that you attach your hard disk has a dramatic impact on the kind of video formats that you can work with and the kind of performance that you can expect from your computer system. For instance, take a look at this table. We can connect our hard disks via USB or Firewire 400 or Firewire 800 or SATA. In fact, I have drives that have all four of those connections on the back of the drive. Which one should I use and why should I care? If we take a look at USB, USB is a perfectly okay way of connecting a hard disk to your computer, but it's not an okay way for video editing. It's too slow. USB on the Macintosh has been optimized to work with wireless devices like keyboards and mice and scanners. It's not fast enough. It doesn't give us the throughput that we need to reliably edit video. A much better way to connect a hard disk is FireWire 400. Now, according to the way that FireWire 400 spec is written, we should be able to get 50 megabytes a second of data off a FireWire 400 drive. <laughs> but should and do are totally different. A FireWire 400 drive will give us about 20 to 25 megabytes a second. Individual hard disks will vary, but a really good range to look at is 20 to 25 megabytes a second when you connect your FireWire 400 drive to your computer. Take the exact same drive, disconnect the FireWire 400 cable, plug in a FireWire 800 cable, and now you're going to get 40 to 50 megabytes a second. The exact same hard disk, but simply connecting it via FireWire 800 will double the speed of data coming off your hard drive. Or one of the new SATA drives. If you take a SATA drive and connect it to your computer, you'll be able to get 75 to 90 megabytes a second coming off the exact same hard drive that you're connecting via FireWire 800 or FireWire 400. When in doubt, connect your drive via SATA. There's also a couple hidden secrets about FireWire that you need to be aware of. On the Macintosh, on any Macintosh, whether it's a laptop or it's a tower, FireWire is hubbed. What that means is if I plug a FireWire 400 drive and a FireWire 800 drive into my computer at the same time, because the FireWire connections are hubbed, my FireWire 800 drive will slow down to roughly FireWire 400 speeds. <laughs> I did a test of this a little bit ago. I, I had a drive, FireWire 800, plugged it into a Mac Pro, and I measured the data transfer rate coming off that FireWire 800 drive when a FireWire 400 drive was plugged in at the same time. It gave me 24 megabytes a second of read speed and 32 megabytes a second of write speed. Writing is the speed with which it records and reading is the speed with which it plays back. I shut down the computer, I unplugged the FireWire 400 drive, plugged in the FireWire 800, measured the speed again, 58 megabytes a second write and 57 megabytes a second read. More than double the speed simply by disconnecting a FireWire 400 device and just taking the FireWire 800 and plugging it directly into the computer. Well, if all you have is FireWire 800 devices, why do you care? The reason you care is that decks and cameras never connect via FireWire 400. They're always slower. They may use a FireWire 400 plug, but they're not transferring data at FireWire 400 speed. They're transferring at FireWire 200 and 100 speed, which means that these drives that you've got that are attached via FireWire 800 are slowing down to match the speed of your cameras and decks. Now, if you're shooting DV, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference because DV is a slow enough format that even running at FireWire 400 or 300 speed is going to work pretty well for DV. But as you start to move to other video formats, this slowdown in your high-speed hard disks is going to make a material difference in whether you're able to edit smoothly or you're always getting drop frame errors. 
So the idea is, if you have the ability, if you're working with FireWire 800 drives, then get a card that plugs into your computer and have your FireWire 800 drives plug directly into that card, which sets up a whole separate data bus. And this can be used on both laptops and towers so that now your slow cameras and decks can plug directly into the computer and your high-speed hard disks plug into the second card. And all of a sudden now, you're getting the performance out of your hard disks that you expect without your camera and videotape decks slowing things down. <laughs> I'm reminded of another dirty little secret of hard disks. And that is, the fuller a hard disk gets, the slower it goes. When a hard disk is totally full, it stops. It neither plays back nor records. You always want to leave free space on your hard disk. And there's a lot of argument about how much free space is enough free space. So I suggest that if you want to get maximum performance out of your hard disks, you always have 20% free space. Believe it or not, your hard disks are fastest when they're the emptiest. The emptier your hard disk, the data goes on and comes off at blinding speeds. But, you know, buying a hard disk to leave it empty is not what most of us would want to do. Instead, we want to try to fill it up. So as you fill it up, just know that the speed of that hard disk, the transfer speed, the, the rate that it moves data from the hard disk to your computer is going to slow down. And as it slows down, at some point, it's going to slow down that you're going to start to get drop frame errors. Drop frame errors are caused by a hard disk which isn't fast enough to meet the demands of the video format that you've selected. Again, DV has very, very small footprint. But other formats, XDCAM, DVC Pro HD, HDCAM, these can be from medium size to gigantic. And here, every ounce of performance you can get out of your hard disk makes a difference, which is why you want to try to leave at least 20% free space on your hard drives. So, for FireWire drives, have a separate data bus, a card that plugs into your laptop or plugs into your tower that you can attach your hard disks directly to that. And that isolates your FireWire attached hard drives from the speed of the data coming off your cameras and video decks. And then second, keep your hard disks emptier. But we started to talk about high definition video and we moved over into hard disks. Well, understanding the speed of the hard disk is important because that's how we're going to move back into high definition video. So let me just summarize. USB is not fast enough for video. Firewire 400 is fast enough and gives us a data transfer rate of between 20 and 25 megabytes a second. Firewire 800 between 40 and 50 megabytes a second. And SATA gives us a speed of around 75 to 90 megabytes a second. Well, let's take a look at this table. When we take a look at this table, notice the format for DV, whether it's NTSC or PAL, doesn't make any difference. DV NTSC moves data from point A to point B, your computer to your hard disk, your hard disk to your computer, your camera or your deck to your computer. That data transfer rate is 3.75 megabytes a second. Well, if I'm moving data, let's round it up to four because it makes my brain hurt to work with 3.75. If I've got four megabytes a second and my hard drive is FireWire 400, that means that my hard drive is moving data 20 to 25 megabytes a second and my video format's four megabytes a second. I got all kinds of headroom. Life is hunky-dory. We move on. But if I do a dissolve, a dissolve means that I've got to play shot number one and shot number two at the same time, four megabytes a second plus four megabytes a second, that's eight megabytes a second. Hmm, suddenly, the speed of my hard disk starts to become more important. If I'm doing a multi-camera shoot and I've got four DV shots, that's four megabytes for shot one, four megabytes for shot two, four megabytes for shot three, four megabytes for shot four, that's 16 megabytes a second coming off my 20 megabyte, 25 megabyte a second FireWire 400 drive. Nine cameras, nine times four, 36 megabytes a second. I'm not going to be able to do that well enough off of FireWire 400 drive. It can't move the data fast enough. I got to get something faster. Suddenly, the speed with which we're able to move data coming off our hard drive and the video format are directly intertwined. And there's another secret about hard disks you need to know. The first is that FireWire speed changes depending upon what kind of devices you have plugged into your computer. The second is the fuller a hard disk gets, the slower it goes. And the third is that there's always an overhead between the computer and the hard disk talking about, oh, the weather and coffee and breakfast and what they're going to have for lunch and moving data back and forth. They're doing this back and forth business 20% of the time.
This means that if I've got a, a Firewire 400 drive that, that moves data 24 megabytes a second, 20% of that 24 megabytes a second, 5 megabytes a second, is the computer and the hard disk talking about something other than me. This is just a waste of space as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and it's slowing down the ability of the hard disk to move data from point A to point B. Great. So not only do we have to worry about the speed with which we're attaching our hard drives and worry about making sure the hard drive doesn't get too full, keeping that 20% free space, we've got to reserve 20% of the data transfer rate from the hard drive just for the computer and the hard drive to have this back-channel communication. Just when you think you've got it figured out that Firewire 400, Firewire 800, and SATA drives go at these different speeds, the technology industry throws in a whole new concept called a RAID. R-A-I-D. It stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Devices, or Redundant Array of Inexpensive Drives, or Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. There's a lot of debate on that last point. But whatever it is, a RAID is multiple hard disks all stacked together and acting as though they're a single, very fast, very large hard drive. And there's multiple different flavors of RAIDs. There's a RAID 0, there's a RAID 1, RAID 3, RAID 5, RAID 50, RAID 60. They'll probably come up with a RAID 72 next week just to drive us all nuts. But in point of fact, there's really two broad categories of RAIDs. A RAID which is fast, which has no data redundancy, which means your data is not protected, and a RAID which is fast and does have data redundancy. RAID zeros can be as small as two drives stacked together. They're cheap, they're fast, and the nice thing about them is they work fine for video editing. The problem is, is that if you lose one of your hard drives, <laughs> you've lost all of your data. And that's because files are not stored on this drive or that drive. Pieces of the file are stored on both. And because pieces of the file are on both drives, I have to have both drives to have all of my data. To solve that problem, we had to invent something called data redundancy. This means that if I lose one of my drives, I simply plug in a new drive, my data automatically rebuilds. Well, the absolute most redundant drive is a RAID 1. What a RAID 1 does is it's got two drives here. Let's take two drives. And I put the data here and I put the data here. And the exact same information is recorded on both drive 1 and drive 2. If drive 1 dies, I pull it out, put in a new drive, and all the data which has been copied to drive 2 automatically is rebuilt to drive 1. RAID 1s are perfect for servers because you want to make sure that the information on your server is adequately backed up. The problem is, is that RAID 1s are really, really slow. And video editors hate the phrase, really, really slow. So RAID 1s are not a good choice in most instances for working with video data. The speed is just not there. So then we look at RAID 3. A RAID 3 gives us high performance, but RAID 3s tend to be optimized for working on PCs. The equivalent on a Macintosh is a RAID 5. The fewest number of drives you need for a RAID 5 is 3, but most RAID 5s are 4 or 5 drives. And what they do is they record your data simultaneously to all these disks at the same time. Remember, it acts like a single hard drive, which is really fast and, and really big. But then they record what's called parity data, which is data about your data. This parity data is recorded to a special place on the RAID. That way, if a single hard drive dies, you pull that bad hard drive out, put the new hard drive in, and the parity data stored elsewhere on that RAID all comes back and repairs the missing data. RAID 5s are more expensive than a RAID 0. But isn't it nice to know that in the event one of those hard drives dies, you can rebuild your data? Well, a RAID 6 is just like a RAID 5, except in a RAID 6 you can lose two hard drives at the same time and your data still rebuilds. So, if I lose a hard drive on Monday, I take the hard drive out, I put a new hard drive back in, all my data is rebuilt, and then I lose another hard drive on Thursday, something, by the way, that has never happened to me in over 30 years of computing. But if I did, then you pull out that, that hard drive, put in a new hard drive, because the hard drives don't die at the same time, a RAID 5 is more than adequate for that situation. If, on the other hand, on Monday, Drive 1 and Drive 2 both die at the same time, you've lost all your data, because a RAID 5 only supports one bad disk at a time. A RAID 6 would support and fix two bad disks at the same time. A RAID 50 combines both the data redundancy of a RAID 5 with the speed of a RAID 0. 
These are drives that used to be the old Apple XServe RAID, was a RAID 50, the Promise drives, and, and other high-speed, high-performance drives that are in the ten to $15,000 category are RAID 50s. And a RAID 60 allows you to lose multiple hard drives within the RAID. If you need absolute security and absolutely the fastest performance, a RAID 50 is the way to work. If you need reasonable performance, and by that I mean 2 to 400 megabytes a second, excellent for, for most high-def formats, a RAID 5 is going to be fine. If you need absolute performance, good speed, but the dirt cheapest price, a RAID 0 is the best way to work. So the RAID that you pick is really dependent upon the price you want to pay and how much security you want. For instance, I do a lot of my editing on a RAID 0. My projects are short. If I lose a hard drive, I haven't lost anything. I'm done with the project in less than a week. For me, a RAID 0 meets my needs. But as soon as I move into a project that's going to last for a month or two months or three months, RAID 0, I don't want to run the risk of losing all of my data. For me, a RAID 5 is much more important. Your choices are the same. You can balance performance and price. Remember, with RAID 5, you can lose a hard drive and all of your data gets rebuilt. My recommendation is, where possible, work with RAID 5s. You'll find that you get good performance and good data reliability. For the complete version of these video basics, become a subscriber. Visit LarryJordan.biz slash subscriptions. For one low monthly fee, you can access hundreds of hours of video training. And thanks for watching.